This Week in Radio Tech, episode 270, is brought to you by the Axia Fusion AOIP Mixing Console. Fusion, where design and technology become one. By Zipstream 9x2 Streaming Software. Omnia 9 Audio Processing with Undue Technology, plus reference quality stream encoding. And by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. On this War Stories edition of This Week in Radio Tech, we draw upon Chris Tobin's years of experience in the radio engineering trenches. From power outages, to gelled diesel fuel, to police inquiries, and shelter in place. Chris has been there and done that, and lived to tell about it. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. I'm coming to you live, or unless you're watching recorded, I'm coming to you from the Intercom stations in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, boy, a lot of history here. And the Intercom stations, uh, this is a fairly new place for them. They've been in here about five or six years or so. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, this is the show where we talk about everything radio technology, from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and antennas and coax and all kinds of stuff in between. Uh, our show is uh, number 270, and that means it's a War Stories episode. So Chris Tobin and I are going to reminisce about engineering feats of daring do that we've uh, been involved with. And, uh, hey, if you're in the chat room watching live on the GFQ Network, you're welcome to, uh, to chat us up and, uh, and, and give us a, a, uh, you know, your story or remind us of something we should talk about uh, there uh, on, in, in the chat room. So please uh, feel welcome to jump in there and do that. So, uh, so I'm Kirk Harnack. I've, uh, I work for the folks at Telos. I'll tell you about that bias right now. I'm part owner of some radio stations in Mississippi and in American Samoa. And I'm getting ready to go uh, back into Mississippi and do some engineering work there next week. Uh, so we'll have more, more tales to tell, I suppose. My co-host, our usual co-host, is with us, and that is Chris Tobin, the best-dressed engineer in radio, live from his secret lair. Not so secret. Anybody, anybody can see him there along whatever avenue that is. <laughs> in, true, in true. It's, it's not that difficult. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, in New York City, nobody looks up. It's always looking down and heading ah. into, you know. Heading for your de destination. So, it's, well, it's welcome in, Chris. I'm, I'm glad you're here. By the way, I'm going to, because it's nice, I'm going to give you a little weather report here. Uh, we had horrible rain for the past day and a half in, uh, in West Tennessee, and that has pushed out the cold that you've been hearing about for the past few days snow forecasts for Wyoming and, uh, and, and uh, Montana and Colorado Rockies. Uh, states and places like that. Well, that cold front is push has pushed through Tennessee, so the temperature is just beautiful. It's a beautiful, sunny, dry, and cooler than usual day here in Memphis, Tennessee. It's just gorgeous, and um, uh, I'm in a gorgeous office park here where Intercom has moved to a few years ago. So that's that's the forecast here. It's a beautiful, beautiful Chamber of Commerce day here in Memphis, Tennessee. How are things looking in New York, Chris Tobin? Audio. Well, that's interesting. Skype just muted me. Uh, now, the weather here is not as good as what you have. It's humid. It's about 87 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, the sky is becoming uh, very cloudy, large clouds coming through. The wind is picking up, and they're calling for um, heavy rains this evening into tomorrow morning. And then there's a cold front, I guess, coming across. So that's what we're going to get sometime tomorrow afternoon. So right now it's a miserable day, <laughs> miserable oh, afternoon. No. Sorry to hear that. Well, you know, a lot of times we, we, <laughs> we do the weather. It's not only something to talk about, but engineers, I think, generally are a little bit interested in, in the weather because it does affect uh, what may happen on our transmitter sites. It does affect uh, things like microwave shots. It does, it can affect uh, satellite communications if there's, you know, really heavy thunderstorms and you're using some KU band satellites. So weather is, I think, always a, a pretty interesting thing for uh, engineers to be uh, to be worried about. So I appreciate the, the weather updates from New York City. Hey, Chris, uh, there's a chance that I may be able to um, uh, come see you guys in New York City at the end of, um, what, the end of September? Yeah. Uh, the AES convention is going to be going on in, in New York City. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. AES, yeah, definitely. Uh, we should all get together. It'll be perfect. Let's see. I was uh, looking up here. You know, uh, uh, we'll probably have David Bialik on for a little bit. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. It's the end of October, not the end of September. End of October. Yeah. So yeah. actually, it's right around Halloween time uh, at the Jacob Javits Center. It's the 139th International Convention of the Audio Engineering Society, um, October 29th through November 1st. 
and there are a, uh, a lot of interesting tracks going on there. We'll, we'll have some more details about that as we get closer. But one of the things that I want to mention that uh, David Bialik is working on putting together is the 50th anniversary celebration of FM broadcasting from the Empire State Building. Oh, did very you, nice. Did Happy you know it's been 50 call. years for, for FM? I did not know that. I'm sorry, I cut you off. That was What was the FM? Yeah, did you know it's been 50 years for FM from, from ESB? I did not know that. I'll have to do some research now. I know it was I knew it was coming up. I didn't realize it was this year. That's great. Was it Edward Armstrong broadcasting from the top of the Empire State Building? I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. And that's that's one reason to have Bialik on to talk about that. Uh, it's gonna be a there's gonna be a standing room only crowd for a for a an, an event that will likely be held at the Empire State Building itself, up near the transmitter floors in a conference room. And um, David is working on uh, one very interesting possibility. It's not guaranteed yet, but it's possible, possible that um, they're going to make the Empire State Building lights synchronize to the song FM No Static at All by Steely Dan. And they're working on getting a live helicopter shot of that. So, wow, lots of interest. Yeah, and, 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 wait a minute, now how much would you pay? Um, we may we may be able to stream the event here on this week in Radio Tech. So. Oh, very nice. Okay, definitely have to give uh, Dave a call and find out what is, what's going on. Well, I'm sure I'll be here from him shortly. Now, r right now, all these things that I've mentioned uh, uh, with regard to the event, I, they're going to have the event. I mean, David will put something together, and it'll be terrific. Uh, but with regard to the the lights on the Empire State Building, the helicopter shot, and streaming it live, those are all you know. Uh, brainstorm ideas. Uh, we don't know for sure if they're going to happen, but we're sure going to try to make it happen. So, well, that's how it starts. You have to have the brainstorming. You have to have the, the 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 thoughts and the crazy stuff, and go. Okay, from all this quantity will come something of quality, and that's that's how you do it. So he's doing the right thing. No exactly. reason not to say that. No reason not to even think that or or suggest it. Now is the time to do it. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, uh, so Chris Tobin and I are here for uh, Tort Number Two Hundred Seventy War Stories. We'll have those coming up in just a minute. I want to talk to you about the Axia Fusion Audio Console. Axia is uh, one of the sponsors of This Week in Radio Tech. And the Axia Fusion Console is, is literally taking the sales at, uh, at Axia by storm. I, of course, I, I do work for the folks at Telos. I'm plugged in a little bit to hearing about uh, sales numbers and you know how fast products are going out the door from time to time. And I just heard in the past week that Fusion console sales are just amazing. People are loving this audio console. So let me tell you about what what is Fusion. Well, you know, if you've if you've paid any attention at all, you know that Axia is the company that brought audio over IP to the broadcast studio uh, back with the original Smart Surface console about 11 years ago. Um, yours truly, I put the first one into a radio station at WEGL in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, Mark Johnson was there with us, and we put this console in, and we're on the air, and, and uh, it's, it's just been amazing ever since. Well, the next console to come out was the Axia Element console. And, of course, Axia still is making and shipping the Element console. In fact, the building where I am right now at Entercom, they have, I don't know, about six or eight, maybe they have eight Axia Element consoles plus some smaller ones, too. So they've Definitely got them here, and they've been using them here uh, since this place was built six years ago. So uh, uh, they're very delighted with them. Well, uh, things evolve. New models come along, and people want some additional features or a different look. And so the Axia engineers, the R&D engineers, probably about four or five years ago, actually began working on this new console, the Axia Fusion. Now, it's almost a direct replacement for the Axia Element. Uh, the Axia Fusion has a lot of the same look, and uh, you know the, the way it's put together is a bit similar to the Element. It's modular. Uh, it has uh, frames that it goes in, and you can get anything from a, a small console with... Uh, with uh, four faders to a large console up to about 40 faders. You can have a split console like is being shown on your screen there. You can see so you can split uh, two physical surfaces into one logical surface if you want to put something in the middle or just have them angled toward the, uh, toward the talent. Um, and the modules that you can get for a Fusion, very similar to what you'll find available for the Element. You have fader modules, of course. You have telephone control modules 
to control a phone system like the Telos VX system or, uh, or, even, or one of the older uh, Telos uh, phone systems. So they'll work great with that too. And you have the possibility of intercom modules in the, uh, in the Fusion console. I'll tell you what, Intercom is really uh, starting to make a, a real inroads into broadcast facilities. We're finding out, broadcasters are finding out, engineers are finding out, talent is finding out how useful an Intercom system can be. And with Fusion, it's built right in. It uses the same Axia infrastructure, the audio over IP live wire infrastructure as everything else does on a live wire network. So the intercom modules built into the console would be right there. They can also have, you can have standalone modules, rack mount modules, desktop modules to allow you to have quick, easy communication throughout. And when you have an intercom system on an Axia network, the audio is not, it's not, no, it's absolutely full fidelity. 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, uh, 48 kilohertz sample, 24-bit bit depth, just like any other audio on a live wire audio over IP network. The intercom audio is fabulous. So you can actually put it on the air. Uh, lots of cool uses there. There's also um, uh, very interesting uses for intercom being available over distance, you know, from one facility to another through, say, a Telos iPort uh, or, or, or another codec could work, too, to get um, audio over the Internet or, or over other telco facilities between intercom systems. So many possibilities. The Fusion console, um, there's uh, videos on the uh, YouTube channel. For Axia, so you can go look at go to YouTube, look for Telos Alliance, and look at the videos that are about the uh, the Fusion console. Very gorgeous. It, it looks great. It works fantastically, and the durability of the console. That's one thing they really wanted to build into it. You, you just you, you can't rub the markings off. They'll never rub off. They're uh, laser etched and double anodized. You've heard me talk about it before, and I'm just a big believer in this console. It's just amazing. The Fusion console from Axia. Uh, go visit it at uh, telosalliance.com and look for Axia Networked Consoles. And thanks a lot to, um, uh, to Axia for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right. Uh, and uh, like I said, yeah, I'm at a place right here that has uh, a bunch of element consoles, uh, and, and they're just pumping along just great. Some of the best stations in Memphis, Tennessee are right here at, uh, at Intercom. All right, Chris Tobin, how about uh, we talk about some more stories? Sure, why not? It's summertime. It's got to be a good one. There's a few to think of. You have you have something you want to start with, or shall I? I, I was going to see if if you would start. Uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm working on my um, on how just how to put together a, a particular story from here in Memphis uh, some years ago. So if you got something started to to tell us about, let's go. And I'll, I might pepper you with questions. Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, let me see. About I guess it was four months ago, five months ago, I got a call from a friend. Uh, looking for some help with an air conditioning issue at his uh, transmitter facility. And um, I was like, I don't know why you need me to come out there. I said, you should probably call your you know, contractor for that, the vendor. And he said, well, he did, but we, we can't seem to find the problem. I was like, oh, okay, okay, this is kind of strange. <laughs> uh, I was like, all right, I'll come on out. I, you know, I like going to transmitter sites. And uh, you know, I said, what's the, what's the problem? Well, the problem is uh, during the day, Everything seems to be working just fine. The building gets the proper temperature. They try to keep it around 70 degrees, 68, uh, 69, 70. And, but in the evening, the temperatures suddenly drop. The, the, the unit just goes into overdrive. And it just you know, wants to keep cooling, keep cooling. And what happens is it freezes the, uh, the compressors because they oh. came properly. The, the temperature balance is, is not there. And uh, I was like, okay, that's usually a sign of a thermostat problem. And he goes, yeah, that's what they check, but can't seem to find the problem. We spent a couple of days going over this, trying to figure it out. It's like, uh, everything points to thermostat control of some sort. Turns out, uh, remind, uh, it turns out that the RF from the site was getting into the system. The site happened to be a directional AM, a very oh. high-powered directional AM. And it wasn't getting in at the thermostat side where you would think to look for it. Because why not? Because the thermostat controls your air conditioner. It's, you know, that's conventional thinking. No, 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 no. This particular air conditioning system, which is a very nice one, very, uh, very modernized, unlike the older ones that we've probably had in the you know, years past, which was basically mechanical, relay turned on, turned off. That was it. This one was a little bit of a microprocessor, DSP-based. The RF was getting in at the controller side on the unit itself. It turned out that the last service call when they did some work in the control cage, I'll call it, they forgot to put back, or at least they thought they did, put back the ground wire, which is for the motherboard. There are several of them. Turns out this one particular one, if you have it removed, it 
it creates a ground plane on the motherboard that actually radiates the signal, not drain it off the ground. Because <laughs> we took a field strength meter, oddly yeah. enough, and you know turned up the attenuation as much as we could. And as soon as you put the, the ground wire to the motherboard, to the, the screw connector, the needle on the meter would drop. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Take it off, it would come back up. I'm like, wait a minute, it's re-radiating. Those of you who take monitor points, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, we're like, no way. It can't be something as simple as that. Sure enough, it was. <laughs> so, so word, yeah. word of advice. <clears throat> AM sites especially, but if you're in a multi-site of FM where there's a lot of RF, make yeah. sure the ground wires are put back in place on all of your equipment, regardless of what you think it is, air conditioning or not. <laughs> it was just the wildest experiment. I was like, Wow. You know, when you go to an AM site and somebody's having a problem, you immediately yeah. have to think RF. Yeah. yeah. But I, I have been to a couple of FM sites that are multi-user sites that the FM RF was an issue. But AM, it's usually more pervasive. Right. But uh, I, have you found that at AM sites, when you have an issue with RF, that it's easier to mitigate at an AM site than at an FM site? Have you found that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely, without a doubt. So it, AMRF it is, is so easier true. to get rid of with good grounding techniques, bypass capacitors if you have to, than FM is, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's probably probably because of just the uh, the frequency at the yeah the frequency the operating frequencies. You're reminding me of a couple of stories from from here in Memphis, and one of them I want to start out with a very simple story. And you know, hey, we have engineers watching this podcast and listening to this podcast of of all different stripes, of all different experience levels. So I'm going to tell the first story here. Uh, it, actually, it's, it's more of a, a story with a tip. Uh, that, and and it's, it's, it may seem simple, but to me it was magical, and I was so glad that it worked well. And that is that uh, here in Memphis, Tennessee, back in probably, oh, about 1989, I would say the summer of 89, um, I was the engineer for what was then called um, Rock 98. And uh, I think the call sign was, it may have still been KWLN. Our uh, studio was in downtown Memphis in what used to be called the Three Sisters Building. Uh, it's at 88 Union Avenue. I just walked by it today, this morning, on my way to go get a, get a sandwich and a cup of coffee. And uh, this building, if, I'll tell you what building it is. If you've ever watched the movie The Firm, Remember that movie, what, almost 20 years ago now? The Firm. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, a party that goes on on the top of the Peabody Hotel in that movie. It's where the wives and the new attorney, played by Tom Cruise, uh, and, and the other uh, partners in, in the law firm, they're all meeting. and They're having a little party on the top of the Peabody Hotel. Well, there's a shot from the top of the Peabody toward the sunset, and you can see another building in the distance and a big, big framework sign on the top of this building. And it says Memphis Business Journal. All right? Memphis Business Journal. If you ever watch the movie The Firm, look for that little clip and, and that's it. That's the building. That sign sits on top of the, the building where the radio station, 98, uh, Rock 98, was. Well, um, by the way, if you look closely on the back of that sign, the Memphis Business Journal sign, you can see a, uh, I believe it was a, a four-foot Mark STL antenna. I put that there. <laughs> so, so, hey, look, look, in the movie. There's, there's wow, my the STL. Prop master. Yes, the prop master. So, okay, back to, back to the story. I, I could have made a story just about the STL antenna, but okay. So, yeah, we were shooting from there up to, I think, 20 three miles away to Frenchman's Bayou, Arkansas, which is where our uh, tower was. Uh, uh, so, okay. Started out as a 700-foot tower, later became a 1,200-foot tower. So it was 4th of July, and the radio station last minute said, hey, why don't we just do some commentary from the top of our building while we watch the fireworks? We'll just kind of do a little play-by-play. -play. I mean, we, we weren't the official station of the fireworks like the other station was. And so they said, Kirk, how can we get a mic to the top of the building? And I thought, well, I guess you know, we could use our Marty system, but I don't know. Maybe we have something simpler. So I happen to have um, about, a, I don't know, 500 feet of Belden 8451 wire. And I had never, you know, that's just twin with a shield on it and a drain wire and a jacket. And I thought, maybe I could just make a, I said, do you want one microphone? They said, yeah, that's all we need, one microphone. So I thought, well, maybe I could just make a long mic cord. 
I mean, I had no idea if this would work or not. I'm still kind of a, a budding engineer at this point. Don't really understand all about impedance and things like that. But I thought, I, I can't think of a reason why this won't work. Yes, it'll be mic level. Yes, it'll be a run of, well, probably 200 feet by the time we go down all the stairwell and around and around down the hallways and go plug it in somewhere to the console but or to a mic pre somewhere. But we'll give it a try. And as long as the mic pre maybe has a transformer input, uh, and the, the microphone itself we were using had a, a transformer in it. Hey, it's all balanced. Maybe it'll be good. So um, it's a short story. I, I'm very pleased to, to tell you that it worked perfectly. I, at, at the time, I didn't know you could have a 200-foot mic cord and have it work out well. But it, 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 it certainly did. Just we, uh, I, I put XLR connectors on each end of it, cut it off you know, to about the right length, ran it up the, the, the fire escape or the stairwells or something, and got it up to the roof of 88 Union Avenue in Memphis, same building that's in the firm, uh, in that long shot. And we did a live broadcast from up there with a m microphone, and it sounded just great on the air, just perfect. No buzz, no hum, uh, just perfect level. Chris, is there, is there anything I should have been afraid of or worried about in, in running a 200-foot mic cord? No, no. You know what? It, it, the, if the cable's right and the building you use is, is more than enough shielding, you're fine. You know, how about this? I had a, a, a incident, an incident, um, a situation many years ago during a blackout here in New York City, uh, working at a radio station, and uh, we too were in a uh, skyscraper building, you know, studios and, and whatnot. And sadly, um, our generator didn't work as well as it should have on on a few things, and we um, we discovered that the generator was working fine on most circuits except one of the circuits for the uh, small room at the rooftop where the STL was housed, but somehow did not get on the circuit with the generator. So uh, needless to say, when the lights went out, UPS is kicked in, STLs were still up and running because the UPS was online, and we got the alarm that the UPS was not seeing utility. And we're going, that's odd, we're on generator, everything else is working. Well, it's a 50-story building, we're on the 10th floor, and I have to come up with a way of powering the STL system up on the rooftop and I had probably about, I think, 20 minute, no, 30 minute oh. window because the, the UPS oh. was oversized because it was just a small little uh, T1 transmitter, uh, an IP radio link, yeah. uh, 5.8 gig. So, we, you yeah. know, we had plenty of capacity, but not enough time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, so now what do we do? Well, oddly enough, we were able to find enough extension cords, large extension cords, and the building what? was good enough to help us out. And we Dang. ran power lines up through the staircase, the power the extension cord up through the staircase to, to where we had to go. As crazy as it was, it worked. It, the voltage drop was there and uh, we you know, were definitely at the edge, yeah. but it worked and worked long enough for me to find a way to get onto the generator circuit. Oddly enough, again, this is one of these things that's just, you know, when you're dealing with contractors and you're trying your best to, you know, stay on top of them without stepping on toes or appearing to be, you know, overbearing even though you're the client, it turns out the outlets that were put on the generator circuit were up in the room, but on the other side of the room, for something else, that had nothing to do with the radio station. How that happened, we still don't know, because all the paperwork I had definitely showed a diagram and a drawing for the right spot. So after we discovered that, because our main goal was get power up there and figure out how to make this longer, because we have no idea how long this blackout's going to last. Right. And uh, sure enough, we're in the room, and I look over, and I see a battery charger light up. It's lit. And the battery charger was part of the two-way radio repeater for the building uh, maintenance and security. It's like, they don't have a generator. How are they? Oh, no. Sure enough, that was our circuit. <laughs> oh. oh. So, you know, af after that, we just you know, took a small extension cord and plugged in our gear, and we got back up and running. But it was just one of those things where you, you, you sit back afterwards, or you do the post-mortem, if you will, and you think about it and you go, even though we had the paperwork, the drawings, if you will, uh, we discussed it. We, we, the one thing we didn't get to do because of the, the way the, the, the rules were written in the building as far as what you can do walking around, who you can do, what you can touch. The one thing we didn't get to do was verify one of our people, one of our staffers, to verify the outlet that we were plugged into was truly on generator. We had to take the word of the electricians. And that's the one thing that I, moving forward since then, this is you know, 10 years ago, I said, from now on, any work that I'm doing with contractors and it requires a mission-critical uh, component, 
I want to see it work. I want to see it in emergency mode. I want to see that circuit is live. Yeah. yeah. No more. And I've had a few times over the years where I got challenged by local um, uh, contractors saying, well, you know, you just can't do that. I was like, yes, I can. Matter of fact, I've only paid for 50% of the job. If you want the other 50%, we're going to do <laughs> a test. Gonna, yeah, yeah. That's part of the contract. And it, it's amazing the number of things that you overlook with that or people just take for granted. And I, I'm not disparaging the electricians. They did very good work. I mean, it was perfect to code. Everything about it was spot on. But they're not broadcasters. So as far as they know, it's a circuit. It's in. Hey, you got to use it. Just plug into it. You know, move stuff over. You know, unplug things, move around. You know, in broadcasting, you know, we don't do it that way. Yeah. So uh, that, was, that, was a, that was one hell of a night. <laughs> you know, you mentioned, um, you mentioned black, the word blackout. And, of course, I'm reminded of the... Uh, the blackout that occurred in the whole Northeast back in, was it 2003? Was that it? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, can, can you get, give me a sense of, of what New York City broadcasting was like during that blackout? Uh, were all the stations off the air? Were some of them on emergency generator power? What, 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 was, this, what was it like then? Oh, wow. That was, that was a wild afternoon. I was coming back from one of the buildings that we operated out of. I was just walking across town. And all of a sudden, I noticed uh, the traffic lights on the avenue were, were dark. I'm like, well, that's what, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I, I forget if it was a Friday or a Thursday. And I'm saying, well, that's odd. Why are these lights out? But it can happen. Then I started noticing uh, cars started backing up on certain streets that normally don't occur at that time of day. And then I started noticing people reaching for their phones and starting to, like, if, I mean, you know, a group, six, seven, dozens of people grabbing their cell phones. I'm saying, okay, that's not normal. Now, be, me being an you know, amateur operator and an you know, RF nut, I happen to have my two-way radio with me, which is on several different channel repeaters that I maintain around the city. So I called out to a buddy of mine. I said, hey, what's going on? I'm in between buildings. He's like, yeah, you won't believe this, but I think there's a blackout occurring. I'm like, what? And then 10 minutes after that, things just went south. And it was still daylight, so the city seemed normal because it was chaos as always, but a little more. Got back to the studios, of course, there was just... Mate, you know, pandemonium. Broadcast-wise, I would say probably almost everybody found their way back on the air through their, uh, what do you call it, broadcast continuity plans, the backup generators, studios, uh, or, or backup, say, if you will, CDs or, or servers that were playing audio while they scrambled to get into position to go back live. Uh, yeah. Everybody was, you know, it, it was pretty, pretty much everybody was in pretty good shape. Uh, there was a few hiccups here and there you always expect. Uh, but when the evening came, when the sun, su sunset, Looking, going up on the rooftop of a 50-story building here in New York City, it's about 500 and, you know, 520 feet above uh, the ground, and looking across out to Central Park, and all you see is black, where you normally oh. would see rows of avenues lit up by street lamps. It was pitch black. I, yeah. I, it was like yeah. a scene out of a movie, you know. And all you would see on, in the distance were these little blue and red lights from police cars going around in the abyss. That's what it looked like, an abyss. I mean, literally, you look off the edge of the roof, and it was just black. So, you know, you had no sense, no, no, no relative point of reference or anything. It was the wildest thing to see. And then also walking along the avenue that evening and to see no cars on 7th Avenue going toward Times Square. <laughs> just people walking <laughs> around. It was just, it was wild. So, so why, why were people not driving? Because the... the well, they closed down a lot of the or? streets for, they, oh. they closed a lot of streets down for emergency traffic. And just, yeah, there's no traffic lights. There was no street lights all as well. So uh, it was pretty much a hazard. But uh, it was just, yeah, it was, uh, it was also reminiscent you know, you, uh, earlier of, of what 9-11 was like when everything got shut down and the city was just, you know, locked down for that 24-hour that period. So but in, it was in wild. Broadcasters, uh, uh, and, and we're talking most about radio broadcasters, uh, New York City being the number one market, I would hope that any broadcaster worth the salt has got a, uh, a you know a continuation plan uh, for their studio and for their transmitter site. Um, what would oh, let's talk about Empire State Building? We talked about that earlier in the show. That's where a bunch of FM transmitters are. Are is every station responsible for its own generator on Empire State? And if so, how do you refuel those things and keep them going up up there? <laughs> Yes. Well, um, if you're fortunate enough to have a generator and yeah. uh, fueling capabilities from years past, then you kept it. Not everybody has a generator at Empire for building code reasons and uh, a lot of things since 9-11. Uh, yeah. It just it wasn't practical. Some folks did have gen sets and others did not. That's why the New York Broadcast Group, a lot of folks have off-site 
uh, transmitter backups in oh. parts of here, part in Manhattan or across the river in, in either uh, Brooklyn or Queens or, or New Jersey, depending on what makes sense. As long as they get a city grade signal, they're, they're okay. Um, and also, you know, since the time of 9 11, people have rethought how they look at their sites here in the city. You know, it's a hard target. So if something, you know, bad is to happen, you know, what, are the, what, what locations are going to get hit first? Oh, wow, my transmitter site, known as the Empire State Building. Oops. Maybe I should have an off-site transmitter somewhere else. Uh, you know, or maybe I should have a studio outside the perimeter of a place that could get locked down. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. There was, there was a lot of things I can say that we as broadcasters here in New York City learned from the 9-11 experience and then to follow it up with a blackout. It was just amazing some of the plans that were put in place because of the security issues that played out very well for the blackout. But generators at Empire State Building are not common practice. It's not that easy to do, and it's a lot of it to do with building code. And also, yeah, yeah getting the fuel up there, because with the new building code, you can't put a diesel tank up there anymore in the same gotcha. way it used to. Well, could, like, it seems like I visited one of the FM transmitter rooms at Empire State, and they did have a diesel generator in there. And I was told they had to bring it up in five, bring up diesel fuel in five gallon buckets. Would they still be doing that nowadays? No, I think you're, I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore. No, I, I'm pretty sure you won't be able to. It's been a while since I talked to anybody at Empire about generators in that capacity. A lot of folks wow. used to have natural gas, so it was a little more convenient. So I've got a, a war story coming up for you in just a couple of minutes uh, about uh, the time we had an ice storm in across Arkansas, Tennessee, and a 1,200-foot tower with chunks of ice falling off of it and, uh, and diesel fuel. <laughs> so all, all that's coming up in just a few minutes. Plus, hopefully, we'll have some, uh, some show and tell from here at, at, at Intercom. If we don't, well, we'll figure out another war story for you. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at, uh, at, at uh, Omnia, and actually a new division of TELUS, or at least a new, a new name, a new uh, mark of, uh, of the TELUS Alliance, which is Zipstream. Zipstream. We've taken, uh, at the TELUS Alliance, we've taken our different streaming and coding products, whether hardware or software, and we've put them under the name of Zipstream. So these are the products that do audio processing and stream encoding. We have a, 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 a phrase around uh, TELUS nowadays called stream like you mean it. And by that, you know, if you're going to do streaming and you kind of need to nowadays. You need for your, your audio to be available. Hey, my little radio station in Mississippi, we use all Zipstream products to stream, and we know we have plenty of listeners on our streams. We're, you know, we're using a CDN now. We're, uh, even a little station like ours, our little one's there, uh, we're finding out we have listeners uh, in a lot of places, a lot right there in, uh, in our hometown in Mississippi, but uh, a few in other places as well. And with uh, <laughs> using the philosophy of stream like you mean it, our audio always sounds really good, thanks to audio processing from Omnia. On a couple of our streams, we're using the, uh, the original three-band Omnia processing for streaming uh, that comes as part of, let's say, the Zipstream um, X, the, I'm sorry, the, 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 the Zipstream X2 product. Uh, that's software that runs on a PC. That's what we're using at our stations. Um, there is uh, another processor available for you. You can get Leif Clayson's Omnia 9 processing in a streaming product as well. That's in the Zipstream 9X2. So there's the Zipstream X2 and the Zipstream 9X2. By the way, you can do upgrades on a per-channel basis if you want to. Just license Life's uh, processor in there. And so you can have really well-processed audio, multiple band, uh, stereo enhancement. You can get, of course, undo and declipping to make your audio cleaner before it ever gets into the processing. And then, what about encoding? Well, the Zipstream X2 and 9X2 have reference code from Fraunhofer for doing your stream encoding, whether it's MP3 or AAC or any of the AAC family, like AAC, um, uh, HEAAC V2 uh, H, uh, or just regular HEAAC. Whichever kind of streaming you want to do that's built in there, you've got choices and uh, you're, you're not using some knockoff code. You're not using something that, well, if you encode it this way, it'll play back on an AAC player or it'll play back on an MP3 player. No, this is the real code, the reference code from Fraunhofer, fully licensed 
And we say that in our ad, fully licensed reference code. And does it make a difference? Well, I think it does. And you're using the good stuff that, that again, is fully licensed. Uh, your stream cannot sound any better at any bit rate that you choose to do it. And what about bit rates? Let's say that you want to stream your station at several different bit rates for mobile users or home users. Well, you can easily do that with, uh, with the Zipstream products. In fact, with the Zipstream X2 or 9X2, uh, when you license it, you're paying for each input, not for each output. So you can take one input, one program input, and you can stream it at different bit rates with different algorithms. Uh, you can even make an instance of simply processing alone. So if you just want to get something processed and bring it back out of the computer, you can do that as well. And what about getting audio into and out of the computers? Well, you can use sound cards, multiple input, multiple output sound cards. You can just use the sound card that's part of a motherboard, or you can use Livewire to go in and out. Uh, in fact, uh, Zipstream X2 and 9X2 now comes with Livewire IP audio driver built into the software. So you don't even have to separately install uh, a single or multi-channel Axia IP driver. It comes with that in the software. So many possibilities. Uh, metadata as well, plenty of metadata filters and, and just the, the things you need to make metadata work on your stream are all built in to Zipstream X2 and 9X2. You should check it out on the, uh, on the TELUS website. Go to telusalliance.com and look for streaming products. Zipstream uh, X2 and 9X2. That picture right there you see on your screen, that is the uh, Leif Clayson 9 processing that is available as an option uh, for you. And that's, uh, that would be included in the, in the Zipstream 9, 9X2 product. I'm using that on several of, of our streams at uh, Delta Radio. Love the stuff. Works great. And by the way, if you're a little bit worried about running it on a PC, know that these streaming products all run as a service on the PC. They're not apps that, you know, sometimes apps can you know, get bogged down and fail or have a crash in one way or another. These are low-level services that are running, and your, your window into those is the only app, and that would be either the uh, NF Remote software uh, or your, uh, your, your browser of choice. Either way, you can look into what's going on. But the actual software itself that's running that keeps you on the air, keeps you streaming, is running as a service. So it's very reliable. Thanks a lot to uh, Zipstream for sponsoring this part of This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Chris Tobin, uh, we were talking about generators. And um, I don't know what you get in your part of the country for ice storms, but uh, in, you know, over the 20-plus years I've lived in, in this area, uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi area, man, we have gotten some doozies uh, where, where um, uh, we don't really get much snow, but we get ice accumulations that are just terrifying, uh, bringing down power lines, even big power poles, even metal power towers, you know, those transmission towers that go cross-country, bringing those down. And back in 93, we had the, uh, the ice storm of 1993. Uh, I lived in Memphis. I was um, engineering for our stations in Mississippi that uh, uh, had gone on the air not too long before. And, man, we had this ice storm come in. Well, the station that uh, needed my attention was Rock 98. I mentioned it earlier. And they had a, uh, a, a brand new used generator <laughs> at the transmitter site and a big uh, diesel tank plus a day tank. You know, that's the little one that pumps the fuel into it and uh, pumps the excess. Uh, uh, well, I guess the excess from the engine goes back in the day tank. Um, and, of course, the power went out in Frenchman's Bayou, Arkansas, where the, the big tower was. And... Um, the generator didn't come on, or if it did, it didn't last very long. So I thought, oh, my goodness, what could be wrong? Well, the roads are covered, and I, I really mean covered, with about two inches of ice. Two inches, like this, sheer ice on every single road. Interstate highways, state highways, secondary roads of all kinds, two inches of ice. Now, this is both good and bad. Two inches of ice means um, <laughs> you got to be real careful driving, real careful. In some places, it's just about impossible to not have an accident or slip off the road. But the good news was there was almost nobody on the roads. So I left my house in Memphis driving. Believe it or not, I didn't, I didn't have a four-wheel drive. I was driving a Nissan 300ZX sports car. Now, the good news about a 300ZX, rear-wheel drive, and that – seemed to help me out, and wide tires. Now, that did help me out. And I just picked my way really slowly. Being an engineer, I kind of understand 
the dynamics when you go around a curve and the curve is uh, banked, right? And kind of judging what speed can I go around this curve, like on an interstate, state highway, secondary road, at what speed can I go around this curve with the bank that it has and not have any pressure to the left, out, you know, going to the outside of the curve or to the right or going inside of the curve? What speed do I need to be to just keep the weight of the car directed, you know, perpendicular to the, to the roadway itself? I must be good at that <laughs> because like two hours later, I was passing jackknifed trucks left and right. Almost nobody's on the interstate. This is I-55 going from Memphis up through uh, the, the northeast side of Arkansas, uh, headed up toward the boot heel of Missouri. And, and uh, it was 20 plus miles on this highway. I-55. And then I had to get off at an exit, which was severely banked, you know, intending for you to go pretty fast on this. Got it just the right speed, didn't slip left or right. Uh, nobody on the road, so I didn't have to come to a stop at the top of the ramp to, you know, join the little state road. Came down an intersection, made a slow left turn. And um, then, I, then I had a long straight shot on this little state highway getting to Frenchman's Bayou, Arkansas. Okay. Now, he, I'm not there yet. I'm, 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 I, the tower's in sight. I can see it. It's so flat in this area. I can see the transmitter building. I can see the generator and the tank. And I still must be a mile away. And here's how slippery it was. I'm driving on this road in my 300ZX, and I'm probably going 25 miles an hour, just slow and steady, 25 miles an hour. And I look ahead, and exactly at the point where I have to turn off this road and go to a little little two-lane crossroad that goes to the tr by the transmitter site, there's a car stuck in the road, or it's just sitting there. I'm going 25 miles an hour. I can see it up ahead of me, and it's probably, at, th at this point, I'm probably down to three-tenths of a mile, okay? So what am I talking about here in feet? Maybe about uh, 2,000 feet ahead of me. So that's, that's still six football fields. I let off the gas, which I was barely touching anyway, and I start pumping the brake gently, you know, knowing that every time I touch the brake, the wheels are locking up. This is sheer ice. It is absolutely sheer ice. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pumping the brake, just not hard, just, just touching it, trying to slow down, trying to persuade the car. Okay, car, let's slow down. Let's slow down. It got down to probably about a football field, probably 300 feet. And I, I try, I thought, let's, I'm not slowing down fast enough. And I, so I, I, I guess I locked the brakes up and I just kept them locked up. And I, I, you, 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 I wasn't sure, am I slowing down better with the brakes, with the wheels locked up or with the wheels not locked up? I was trying to, just trying to do this engineering calculation in my head, which is better? And I, throw out whatever you know about that because I had to make it apply right then, right there. And it seemed like the best way to do it was just to leave my foot on the brake. Brakes locked up, sliding, 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 absolutely straight. I got down to, I swear, I got down to probably one mile an hour and bumped the other car. <laughs> it was like crossways in the road. I couldn't turn left or right or stop any faster. Just And it was like the whole thing happening in slow motion. Now, because I was going so slowly and because the other car was on the same ice, there was no damage whatsoever. I, it was like bumper cars, just boop. And, you know, it gave him a little bit of energy, moved him, I don't know, probably five feet. And at the same time, my car stopped because there was just, it was just so low energy at that point. So, you know, we said our highs and goodbyes and everything was fine. And I then turned the car down the little road to the transmitter site. Okay, yes, the story's going somewhere. So I get to the transmitter site. And by the way, the, the, the final hundred feet to the transmitter site is, uh, is a gravel road. And so there wasn't, you know, if, if there was ice on there, which I guess there was, uh, at least it was rocky. And so I had no trouble ne negotiating that. Pro tip, if ice is falling off of a thousand foot tower, probably best not to park your car anywhere close to the tower. By the way, Chris, are you, are you still there? I'm still here, just okay. laughing okay. because I'm, <laughs> I, I know exactly what you've done through. I've been through it. And yes, falling ice at a tower site can be very interesting. Either you're you're bored or or you <laughs> or you're rolling your eyes at the story, so I, I I get I get out of the car, and I keep hearing this noise overhead. <laughs> it's chunks of ice falling off the tower because you know it must be warming or something up you know hundreds of feet in the air, 
I've never done this before. I should have had a hard hat or not even been on site. And I and so I thought, okay, I got to see what's what's the problem here. So I, I went in the building, no power at all. Uh, it was in the, the the transfer switch was in the generator position. The generator wasn't running. I go outside. Again, I I barely have a, a decent jacket on, and uh, so I'm I'm cold. I don't even think I have any gloves. I am so unprepared. It's unbelievable. So I go out there and I I try to. Figure, why isn't there anything? I, I figured well maybe maybe the fuel is gelled up between the big tank and the day tank. And uh, uh, I, I don't remember all the details, but somehow I got some warmth. I think I may have had some heat tape. No, it was, no, I know what it was. You know those uh, look like a hair dryer, but they're for shrinking uh, heat shrink tubing. You know, like a heavy duty, super hot hair dryer for shrinking heat heat shrink. I had one of those at the transmitter site, and so I ran extension cords from the transmitter building outside. Uh, oh, you know what? There was power in the generator because there's AC power out there to... Uh, nope, wait, the power was off. How did I run that thing? I have no idea. I don't know. I, I, I'm, now I'm thinking, I don't know what I did. There wasn't any power out there. The generator wasn't running. I have no idea what I did. Somehow, I got some really? heat. Yeah, I have no... I, yeah, the power was off. I couldn't have run a hair dryer. I had no idea what I did, but somehow I got some heat. Oh, did you plug it into a UPS? A no, I know what it was. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I know what I did. I had a little um, inverter butane. I, 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 I had a little torch. Oh, yes, the handy torch. I had a little handy torch. Yep. Just not, not, not the dual bottle, but just the, I guess, the blue bottle thing. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, the single bottle. Yeah, the single bottle type. It's not super duper hot. And so not as hot as acetylene, certainly. So I took, this is what I did. Now I remember. I took that, well, this is bringing back memories from, oh, jeez. I mean, my kids were little. My old kids were little. And so I took this thing, and I just kept waving it back and forth on the fuel line. <laughs> like this. And I'm thinking, I'm going to blow everything up, or maybe this will work. And I probably did that for an hour. The fuel line was probably 18 or 20 feet long between the, the, the big tank and the day tank. And so I just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. And then it was a few feet from the day tank over to the generator. So I think I did the same thing on it, too. Anyway, I, I, I felt like, okay, I'm touching these pipes now, and they're feeling like, you know, they're not hot, but they're, they're, not, they're not atmospheric temperature either. Uh, I, you know, maybe I got them up to 45, 50 degrees or so. And the whole time, I, 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 so I, I kept, I, I tried to start the generator. Eventually, it started. I had probably been out there for an hour and a half, and I got the generator started. And, it, and it, lo and behold, it kept going. So, again, my memory's a little shaky on this. I was in panic mode, obviously ill-prepared. My, my, my hands were freezing cold. Um, of course, I had this, I guess, well, you can't really apply the burner to your hand. Uh, and at the same time, ice chunks are coming down. I did get hit in the back several times with a chunk of ice. I'm so lucky it didn't hit my head and knock me out. I would have been laying there with this, <laughs> this torch running <laughs> in my hand. Would have that, found that would have been interesting when the emergency <laughs> services arrive and they see you in the <laughs> snow with a torch in your hand, ex exactly. you know, expended and just lying there. They'd be like, what the devil was this guy trying to do? I got to tell you, <laughs> Chris, it, my guardian angel had to be there because think of all the stupid things I did wrong. Just getting there was a miracle. And, and then Clarence and, and, is working hard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez. Got it on the air and it was running. And I, I probably stayed there an hour, hour and a half more after it got running and said, well, there's, there's nothing else I can do now. There's nothing more to babysit. We have a full tank of fuel. It's, it doesn't appear to be gelled up anymore. It was daytime. And, you know, that night it didn't go off the air. So I, maybe it didn't get as cold that night. And I had to run down to uh, uh, Mississippi and get my stations down there on the air. Uh, and that was that's a whole other story. Maybe we'll do do on, a, on another show. So <laughs> I ended up driving what should have been a three hour drive to uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, uh, from Frenchman's Bayou. It ended up being a six hour drive because you, I can only go you know thirty five miles an hour on the ice covered roads there. And by the way, on that trip, Mississippi got hit harder. There was probably a forty mile stretch of highway down U.S. Highway sixty one in northwest Mississippi where there wasn't a power pole standing anywhere they were all down even the steel oh, the, actually in that part of the country there wouldn't uh you know the the dual pole 
with the cross arm and then the, the X brace, and they have three, you know, big, long insulators and the, the high voltage lines. But oh, they yeah. have, but the, 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 they have uh, strength this way, but not this way, right? They were all down for miles. So, geez, what a mess. There were communities that didn't have power for six weeks in, in wow. Mississippi. Yeah, six, six freaking weeks. Yeah, when those so anyway, lines go down, those particular ones are not easy to fix. You can't do them that quickly. Well, they, they had a, a, a power generating plant in Cleveland, Mississippi. It's, it's decommissioned now, but they had it there, and it went offline. And I remember in the, in the, in the weeks afterwards, they couldn't start it because it took power to start it, and they had no power. They didn't have. Oh, they huh. always depended on outside power coming in to start any stuff they had to do there. I don't understand all that, but it was offline. It, it, it would have worked had they had power, but they didn't have power to start the stuff up. So. Oh, they needed a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Oh, yeah. Geez. yeah, I've had some interesting transmitter uh, uh, situations. Let's see. Uh, one of them was an Apollo 13 moment where I. I was working at a station, uh, yeah, I guess it was my first, first or second year working at a commercial station, and the, um, the blower motor on the transmitter went out. It was a low, it's a three kilowatt FM it was, so that, uh, it was a low powered transmitter. And the backup transmitter, unfortunately, was only like a 500 watt box. Meanwhile, you know, the station was a three kilowatt class A, and uh, the difference in signal coverage between the two transmitters was, uh, was immense. So uh, I, I'm trying to figure out how do I, you know, cool this transmitter. How does this make this work? Because it turns out the Collins FM transmitter this was. Uh, the replacement part would be found if you can wait a couple of weeks. So I'm thinking to myself, this is not going to go well. Uh, so I uh, f realized that we have an air conditioner, a wall unit, uh, air conditioning unit, and I found uh, some hosing, a uh, plastic hose, or, you know, can, uh, duct ducting material used typically on the output of a dryer, and you, you duct the hot air out to your window outside. So I was like, wow, this is great. I could probably take this and use it. Well, this ducting was rectangular, and the base of the cooling fan input on the transmitter tube, the PA tube, was round, circular. So just like in the movie, <laughs> we have to make this fit this, <laughs> which was rectangular and circular. Yeah, Mind you, this yeah. is way before Apollo 13. This was 1983. So, I mean, the movie, the movie Apollo 13. Yeah, yeah, before the movie, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm like, how? And I, it was, I pretty much came up with almost the same thing they did. It was a plastic bag with cardboard and tape, and I made it work. And believe it or not, I was actually able to get the 3,000-watt transmitter. Uh, well, it was a 5-kilowatt. The TPO was around 4 and change. I could actually run it around 3,300 watts. And the you know, it's a tube transmitter, so the... The intake to, ex to external, the uh, X take or the output, that is, the te temperature difference has to be something like 80 degrees or whatever. I think that's what IMAX says. I was actually able to get close enough that the two would function. And I didn't have to run it that high. So I still got enough ERP, I got enough cooling, and it worked. I wish I had taken a picture of this setup because I'll tell you, it's <laughs> like watching the movie. But it was just one of those things where you're sitting there, you're like, I'm by myself. What do I do? Who can I call? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm in yeah. a marketplace of, two, of, of one radio station. Uh, the next guy closest is, is a half hour away. Yeah. And it was a Collins transmitter. So at the time, you know, they hadn't made it already for 20 years. So it was not something you're going to get off the shelf. It was a blower motor that was made by Dayton. And I called up Dayton Motor and they were like, oh, wow, that, yeah. And we stopped <laughs> making that particular one a long time ago. You could retrofit the new one, but it's going to take, a, we'd have to call around the warehouses. I'm like, oh, okay. Why don't you start that process while I'm working on this other thing? So it was just one of those things where you have to sort of really think out of the box, and it was it was fun. Not that many people these days would probably get to do that anymore because of the way the boxes are designed, the transmitters are designed. But that was a doozy. That was a good one. And then there was another transmitter side story, similar to yours, with power lines being down. I happened to um, uh, be working at the transmitter site one night. It was a directional AM and a, a single uh, omnidirectional FM at the site, doing some late night work, or evening, or late evening, and then a, or late night. Uh, and um, doing some work, and all of a sudden, the generator goes online. I'm like, oh, great, now what? And because we had the lights and stuff on a small UPSs, and we had a little setup where you could switch the utility generator and not notice it, depending where you are in the building, I heard the generator go on, the little alert, uh, sound alert went off, 
I'm like, all right, great, we're on generator, call the studio. They said, no, there's no power outages. We're not aware of anything. Everything's normal around here. So I start looking around and figure, let me check things. We're on generator. Why not? This is a good opportunity to see how the generator is performing under load. <laughs> and um, as I'm running around, I hear noises outside on the property. Now, mind you, it's a directional AM, so we have a large piece of property for the towers. And it was three towers, and the FM is on one of the three towers. So I hear noises outside, and it's, you know, it's about 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, eh, we normally don't have people around here at this hour. Let me uh, use some caution as I go out the building. I swing open the door. Well, don't swing it open fast. I just open the door slowly. I have my flashlight in hand, my cell phone in my pocket. I s open the door, and there I am greeted with a gentleman in a black outfit with a firearm. And he, he yells at me, who are you? State your business and stand still. I'm like, so I take the flashlight and put it to my face. I'm like, I'm the station engineer. I work here, and who are you? And then the local law enforcement. I'm like, Okay, the cops are here. Why are the cops here with a firearm at my head? This is not yeah. a good sign. Yeah. So it turns out the power got knocked out because a person who was in a police chase who was, uh, decided to rob a car, robbed the building, uh, held somebody at gunpoint, uh, chased through town. They took him onto the back roads. He lost control of his car, hit a power pole, and doing so took down 15 power poles all in one shot because the tension of the wires, you know, yeah. just yeah. In a delicate balance they all have to maintain took everything out, and it just happened to be at the power pole at the end of my property, or the, you know, the, the radio station property. So the police are doing their part, searching the woods for this guy, and they see this little house, three towers, and the light on. So they're thinking, oh, maybe the perpetrator is held up in this building. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, that's not the guy. I'm not the guy. No. <laughs> Needless to say, that was a, I didn't get much sleep that night because I was wide awake for the next six hours. <laughs> and I had to stay in the building. They, they, they put a police officer outside the, the building. I, there was an armed guard outside. He goes, you'll have to wait here until we can tell you if the area is clear. Because in order for you to drive away, you're going to be going through parts that we don't know if this person right. is around and he's armed. Right. I'm like, you know what? No problem. i got plenty of work here I can do. I'll just make a few calls, let people know what's going on so that uh, not to come out looking for me. So that was... <laughs> So that was one extreme from the uh, you know, air conditioning issue to you know, having uh, uh, firearms in your face and police and telling you that there's a guy on the loose on your property with a gun and we thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but think about it. How many of us have worked at transmitter facilities where it's on a piece of property in a remote location in town and yeah. Yeah. You know, it's 11 o'clock midnight. What are the odds of somebody seeing a light on going, oh, yeah, that's normal? You know, back in the 60s when you had transmitter engineers that lived at the site, yeah, that was normal. Yeah, but, yeah. but not, not in 1991, you know, it's a little different. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was a fun one. So you, you since, know, then, I, I, since then, yeah. I used to practice putting signs on the door um, and making sure that anybody coming up to the door, say in law enforcement especially, they, they would know that, okay, this is an unmanned site, there's a possibility this could be an employee. I do everything, and I also used to put a little sign out, en station engineer on duty, on site. That's a good idea. Yeah, put a, I had a magnetic to, sign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Put, put it on the so, door. Uh, I, I had a, a uh, not as dramatic as yours, but years ago I was working on actually this, the same station, but its tower at that time was in Osceola, Arkansas. And uh, they, they hadn't moved yet to Fren the big burgeoning metropolis of Frenchman's Bayou, Arkansas. And uh, I was in the transmitter building late at night. It was an AM and FM in the same building on the same tower in Osceola. And um, I'm probably, it's, it's, it's probably about midnight, maybe 1230. And I've got uh, part of one of the transmitter, I guess it was the FM transmitter. You had it taken apart. Parts scattered all over the floor. And I'm, uh, uh, I think I left the door open. Uh, you know, it's a small town, n nobody around, middle of the night. And uh, I don't think it had any air conditioning in there. So I had, had the door open, trying to get a little, little bit of breeze uh, in there somehow. And I, I heard some noises, like footsteps. And so I slowly, you know, looked around the side of the transmitter, <laughs> the FM transmitter. And uh, it was a gentleman dressed in black, black spit shine shoes and black slacks. And I looked up and there's a big, tall policeman. <laughs> he said, are you okay? I said, yes, sir. I'm fine. I'm supposed to be here. I'm working. <laughs> so we had a quick conversation and he said, well, uh, he didn't have any advice, you know, what, what I should do, but a sign on the door might've been a good idea. Um, hey, there's somebody working here An engineer on duty. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've, I've worked at sites that have been in locations that are not very desirable. 
uh, another site, a location that actually Chris Sher is quite familiar with, and a few other people that we know uh, in in Connecticut. And uh, yeah. it's a place. It's in Bridgeport, downtown Bridgeport. It's a transmitter site that's uh, tra the antenna is located on a power uh, smokestack, and oh. it's in a part of town at this at the time, which I think it's improved since then. But it's in a part of town where, uh, let's just say, y you don't want to be there after sunset because okay. the activities that go on are usually uh, unlawful. But I had to go to the site, and it was a problem. So I drove down, got off the uh, interstate, take the side road down. And as I'm driving down the street to the site, which happened to be co-located on a junkyard. So the junkyard, you had to go through the junkyard the, the, to get to the building that, the, that we had for the transmitter. That, that in itself was a, a, a feat. So as I'm approaching the property, I'm, I'm suddenly stopped by two police cars that just cut in front of me. I mean, literally, you know, cut in front of me, lights blaring, officers get out of the car, come up to my window and, and ask me, what are you doing here? Are you lost? I'm like, no, I'm not lost. I'm going to work. I you know, show my ID, you know, driver's license, the, the business card, the whole bit. And they're like, well, you shouldn't be down here. It's, it's a very bad night. I was like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm off the air and on my backup and uh, the generator's running. So we're trying to figure out what's going on. He goes, no, I don't mean that. It's just a bad night. We'll, we'll escort you to your building. I'm like, what? Well, sure enough, as we approach our building and about another, say, 2,000 feet down the road past our building, there are police cars going by and officers on foot, and suddenly what sounds like firecrackers to the untrained ear were actually mm. gunshots. They were, gunshots. They were in pursuit nice. of drug dealers. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to hang out here in the building. It's a brick building, so I don't have to worry <laughs> about it falling down from anybody blowing on it. But uh, I'll stay here until it's, until it's clear. How about I call the office and check with dispatch and see how you guys are making out? He goes, here's the number to call for direct access to dispatcher. They'll, they'll let you know when it's good to go. I'm like, yeah, all right. Another <laughs> one of these sites where I got out. But the part of town, yeah, it's part of town that's known as Father Panic Village. And uh, those Panic of you Village. who... Oh, gee. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, well known. Yeah, this was a part of... This was 19... What was this? This was 1980-something, 80, 83, I guess. Yeah, it was back in the 80s again. Um, it was just wow! What an experience. Boy, I'll tell you, I learned a lot of things in the early days with with uh, remote sites, and this wasn't very remote. It was downtown Bridgeport. But then again, back in those days, downtown Bridgeport was <laughs> sort of like the South Bronx in the seventies, and uh, uh, it was fun. But again, I you know made it a point to carry proper identification, uh, have a, a have what we call today an elevator pitch, but back then it was just a, basically a, a quick statement as to who I am, what I'm doing, and do it quickly and very calmly. And it paid off uh, handsomely twice uh, going to that site. Sounds like a good speech to practice. You're talking to law enforcement, you want to be clear, concise, and brief. Yeah. Well, hey, if you're an FM operator and you co-locate in a building, say Empire State Building, maybe yeah. World Trade Center, you know, One World Trade, you, there's a good chance you'll be co-located with a lot of federal agencies or local law enforcement, and you may uh, be in your room sure. or on the floor, because, you know, depending on the build-out, if it's a caged area or actual rooms, you might get approached by somebody going, oh, what are you doing up here and why are you here? And think of it this way. In New York City, I can say, in Chicago, L.A., I'm sure it's the same, and maybe even Atlanta or, or uh, Boston. If you're in those sites and there's any dignitaries in town or something going on, they usually send people up to their, their locations to keep an eye on things. So, you know, if you show up in a building where it's usually remote, nobody's there on a regular basis, yeah. you best be prepared to explain your, your presence. I can say this again. I've worked at the Empire State Building for 20 years plus, on and off, and uh, there's a lot of things that go on in that building that if you're in certain parts, you better have a have good reason why you're there when those gentlemen in, the, in yeah. those dark suits show up and ask questions. Our, uh, our show is uh, This Week in Radio Tech, and uh, Chris Tobin and I are talking about some war stories, things we've experienced in the last few years, uh, maybe a longer than that, come to think of it. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Lavo, L-A-W-O, German company that makes audio consoles, pronounced Lavo. You'll find them on the web at lawo.com. And we've been talking about this console now for about a year, and it is just amazing. It's another audio over IP console. So this is certainly an idea that is catching on with uh, companies all around, the, all around the world. It's a great way to do audio in your broadcast facility. Cuts down seriously on, on wiring. And the folks at Lavo have implemented Ravenna and, uh, uh, by reference, uh, AES67 as well into this console. Now, the Crystal Clear console is the one that we're talking about here. It's a console that 
it's part of their crystal line of small radio station consoles. Very capable. Uh, you don't need as many faders nowadays as you used to because uh, everything is assignable instantly. Uh, same thing with this console, the Crystal Clear console. The Crystal Clear uses a DSP engine that sits in a rack wherever you want it to. Uh, it could be in the studio, it could be in a rack room, wherever you want to bring your audio sources to. And uh, it's got some mic preamps built into it. It's got a couple of headphone amps built into it. It's got some uh, analog and AES inputs and outputs. Plus, it's also got all the networking that you need to plug it into a network and run either Ravenna audio streams or AES67 audio streams. Dual power supplies are available for this console as well. Now, the console itself, the part you touch, the part you move the faders up and down, well, that's pretty non-traditional. It's actually a multi-touch touchscreen monitor connected to a PC, and it's running an app that looks exactly like a console. Now, this idea has always been very intriguing to me uh, personally, uh, kind of uh, not, not that I thought of it or anything, but I was thinking about this back in the, uh, the mid-90s, thinking, hey, we've got touchscreens. Uh, I see them using them at McDonald's, some of the earlier ones uh, that didn't work as well. But why couldn't we make an audio console with this? Well, now they are uh, at Lavo. The Crystal Clear console, you can go to the Lavo uh, website, and uh, go to the, uh, the go to the radio products page and look for the Crystal Clear. And there's a video there that is really intriguing. It's Michael Dosh, who's the head of their virtual radio projects division there at Lavo, and he's talking about um, he's going through a demonstration of this Lavo Crystal Clear virtual radio mixing console. And you can see the benefits of it. You can see how easy it is to operate. Run the faders up and down. All the buttons become contextual because you're no longer limited by a hardware interface. The buttons can you know, say what they need to say for the uh, function that you're doing at the time. Um, it's all very interesting. And, uh, hey, there are people who have deployed this console. Also, the hardware version of this console, the, the Crystal console, it uses a, an actual hardware uh, surface. So you can get that uh, as well. If, uh, if, you, if you don't want the touchscreen, you can do it in a, in a total hardware situation. So check it out. Go to Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com, and uh, check out the Lavo Crystal Clear console. Check out Mike Dosh's video there, too. All right, Chris Tobin and Kirk Harnack here on This Week in Radio Tech with War Stories, about to wrap it up. And Chris, I wonder, you know, I meant to ask you before the break if you had a tip for us. And just to give you a second to think about it, I'll tell you about a tip that I ran across actually just today. Uh, you may know that uh, a couple of months ago in Mississippi, I installed an IP radio link between our studio and one of our transmitter sites in Cleveland, Mississippi. And I used the cute little Ubiquity uh, nano bridge um, uh, unit. I don't think they make this exact one anymore, but it, I mean, it's so cute. It looks like, it really looks like baby's first microwave dish. And we have live wire uh, audio over IP running uh, on the six mile link from one end to the other. To my knowledge, no errors. It just sits there and runs perfectly. And I was concerned about um, uh, surge suppression on the Cat5 cable. So I, I bought some surge suppressors uh, off the shelf, and uh, they use, you know, standard RJ45 connectors. You run them in there, and you, you, you ground the, you know, the big ground stud on the surge suppressor, and you run your cable through it. And that's fine. It's got gas-type uh, surge suppressors in, in, inside of it. Uh, but I was just made aware that you can also have uh, surge suppressors that don't use an RJ45 connector. They use screw-down terminals. Now, you've got to be careful with your cable dress because it is Cat5e cable. You might be running a you know, 100 megabit link through there, so you can't have you know, stray wires running hither and yon. So you've got to be careful, but they are screw-down terminals. So you've got a better chance of those terminals uh, carrying more current than you would have probably with an RJ45 connector. So Polyphaser makes these. Uh, at our stations in Mississippi, we're going to do a second IP radio link, and we have turned to the folks at uh, uh, FabCorp, F-A-B-C-O-R-P.com, FabCorp.com. That's Dave Anderson's company. Uh, he's been a guest on our show before. And uh, so they suggested these Polyphaser uh, surge suppressors for, cat, for an outdoor Cat5 installation. So that's what we ordered. They're a little pricier, but um, uh, they really believe in them. And after seeing how they're built, I believe in them too. Same gas you know, type uh, suppressors inside, but you get screw down terminals in a really heavy duty case. So that's my tip. If you're going to be running Cat5e up a tower, and I think you're going to see a lot more of that. So engineers, if you need to learn about that, I think we're going to see, see it more and more. Um, the polyphaser uh, uh, screw down terminals uh, on surge pressures. Good idea. I'll tell you how it uh, turns out. Chris Tobin, how about your tip for today before we leave? 
Uh, a quick, simple tip, I think along the lines of the Ethernet uh, Cat5 stuff we're talking about, is I've been recently working with folks and suggesting a shielded twisted pair Cat, yeah. um, Ethernet cables, even though it's in a studio environment. And the reason I suggest this, many years ago in a facility that we built, uh, we used a lot of shielded twisted parents and locations, and it turns out that it was to our benefit because uh, there's a lot of RF these days in various forms and shapes, whether it's your cell phone or a two-way radio or wireless gear that you might be using. And you never know when it's going to crop up and appear in your facility. And, um, you know, yes, shielded twisted pair might be a little more expensive than your run-of-the-mill you know, untwi unshielded twisted pair, UTP and STP. But it may be worth looking into for some of your installations, especially for the transmitter site. I was at a site... Uh, Last year, they weren't using shielded twisted pair Ethernet, and they were having uh, lots of errors, uh, you know, error concerns on some of their data links, and they couldn't figure out what it was. It turned out to be the Cat5 interconnect. The shielding would have been just enough to, to keep the noise down. So something to think about. And if you're doing a lot of outdoor work these days, you definitely want to go with the outdoor shielded uh, Ethernet cable that's available. I was recently at, I think it's four times square, and they're doing some digital signage work up there. And I looked at the cables they're using for the Ethernet controllers, and it's outdoor shielded, uh, twisted pair. So uh, ah, talking yeah, to one of the yeah. talking to one of the guys, he's like, "Yeah, you definitely don't want to use the other stuff. This is the way to go. It, it's worth it." Hey, so I've so got a question about it, you know, uh, about uh, you know we're going to be taking these runs of Cat Five up a tower, right, to go to uh, a a power over Ethernet uh, uh, IP radio. Uh, do you know what is the best practice? for attaching the Cat5 to the tower. I don't think you want to cinch it down real hard with, with cable ties. You're going to you know, mess up. You could mess up the relationship of the conductors. Uh, if you, if yes, you no, you, you definitely don't want, to, you, know, you don't want to tie it down tight. There is best practice. I believe there, are, there was a company. Oh, I've got to look now. I don't remember. But there, I remember seeing some uh, brochures for mounting hardware for Cat5 outdoor cable, the more rigid stuff. And it was almost like these little O-ring clamps that it didn't put too much pressure on it, but just enough right. to hold it snug. Because, yes, you're right. right. Even indoors, if you're doing work with Cat5 cable, do not tie it tight. Keep it loose enough that you can stick a, a greeny screwdriver beneath the, the, the wires in the tie wrap. Because you will that. change, I, remember, it's yeah, RF I've heard cable. Of, uh, of uh, land contractors cinching it up really tight, or maybe an unknowing broadcast engineer didn't really realize what he's doing, cinching these tight, and you've got cable now that no longer meets the spec. Uh, because yes. you've 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 impinged upon it uh, too much in in uh, at maybe at regular intervals too. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I have exa I have been uh, uh, you know we'll say victim of that situation on many occasions where we'd, we're working on a land and saying yeah this is really weird the performance is not where we'd expect and do a, a land test you know with a fluke tester or, or, or a similar device and you know, all of a sudden it's failing all these tests for 100 meg, 10 meg, I mean, 1 gig, and you're like, That's in, that doesn't make any sense. We've got Cat 6E cable or Cat 6 cable. It's, something's up. Sure enough, you go along the run, and you say, oh, look at that, look at that. We clipped the tie wraps, and as we're clipping it, the guys at the other end with the test are go, yep, it's getting better. Yep, it's getting better. <laughs> it's getting better. Yeah. And I was, like, I was like, wow, that is the best case of you know, cause and effect. But talking yeah. to um, uh, Steve Lampin, we all may know him, or if you don't, sure. the gentleman from Belden, who's a great We need to have him back on the show, too. Yeah. Yeah, great I, I storyteller can stories. tell you some things that just, you know, you know, and he, and he trumps. He's all about trumping Belden, and, he, and rightfully so. But it, one of his recent uh, meetings I was at, he was talking about Ethernet, and I went up to him and I asked him about the, you know, bundling method. He just looked. He was like, "Oh yeah, let me let me think of how many stories can I tell you about that?" Hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, tie wrapping Cat Five cable. Why you shouldn't be doing that. And it's in his delivery style. If you know Steve Lamb, and you'll be like, oh, my goodness. But he, he said, he told me the tests they do at Belden and all these things over the years to try and determine how to properly handle a cable. And it's, a, it's fascinating, the things we've taken for granted with 8451, what you can't do with a Cat5. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's been a good show. I've enjoyed uh, catching up on, on our, you know, reliving these uh, moments of uh, technical daring do and getting hit in the back by ice or you know, power outages and what, what people do about that. Uh, it, it can be a tough world when the power goes out. And so uh, uh, broadcasters, yeah. uh, broadcast engineers need to think out of the box as to how, to how to take care of that kind of situation. Chris Tobin, thank you so much for being with us. And if folks want to reach you and tap into your technical expertise, they can do so where? Support at ipcodex.com. Best way to reach me. I just had some folks the other day call or uh, email about some issues with their uh, Comrex boxes. So feel free to give a shout. I'll try and help you best I can. 
support at ipcodex.com. That is Chris Tobin. And uh, then I'm Kirk Harnack. I work for the folks at uh, Telos. You can uh, reach me, of course, uh, uh, at K Harnack on Twitter or uh, Kirk at Harnack.com. I think my email address is just out there everywhere, so I don't worry about it anymore. Gmail filters it pretty well. Hey, thanks to our sponsors, uh, which are Axia and the Fusion Console, the Zipstream uh, X2 and 9X2 processing and streaming software, and the Lavo Crystal Clear Console. Appreciate uh, those folks sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Suncast has been our producer for the show. Thanks very much to Suncast for the lower third switching and making everything play right. And please subscribe and tell your friends about This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, don't to hesitate to uh, send me an email or a tweet and suggest uh, guests and show topics. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>